I originally gave this presentation at the Portland Emacs Hackers Group in October 2015. Due to AV technicalities, I wasn't able to record it. But due to the many requests, well, both of you anyway, I've decided to record my introduction to Magit, the coolest porcelain for Git that just happens to only run in Emacs. Magit, or Maggot, however you want to pronounce it, I suppose if you love what you're doing, it's pronounced to rhyme with mag magic, <laughs> but other times maggot, I suppose, is more fun to say. Well, this presentation is separated into two sections. First, I will give you an overview and show you basically how to get started and use Magit. Each new tool in your shed, however, requires some investment. So to make things easier for you, you know, to justify the required effort, I'm going to jump the chasm on the maggot rocket cycle and show you some of the cool advanced features that make this tool really compelling. Now, kit porcelains come in three flavors. There's the pretty graphical versions that are really nice, but doesn't know how to give your files the same sort of love that your editor can. I guess this is why version control is part of most IDEs. However, they tend to treat all VC systems the same. For instance, you often can't create local branches because that's a difficult problem in Subversion. We tend to use Git for the cool workflow features that it gives us, which is probably why we use the command line so often. Now don't get me wrong, the Git command line is one of the best. However, it is a bit tedious. You refer to particular commits by either some cryptic ID or counting off the head. Sometimes you need to type. Sometimes you type a lot. Of course, I suppose if you're typing this much, you just create a git alias. Well, the error feedback is also pretty good. Well, once again, for a CLI. Now, Maggot's position is kind of a unique one that, that sits somewhere between all three. It's easier to work than the command line, and it's very Git-specific, so it can do almost everything the command line can. And being in Emacs gives you all the convenience of editing your files. However, to convince you that Maggot is clearly a superior product means I really just has to demonstrate it. So here I've started Magit status, and at the top it shows me both my local branch information as well as my primary remote. The page shows me different sections that I can easily move around here. Now, once I move to a particular file, well, I can manipulate it with a single keystroke. So here I'm just going to stage this one and this one and oh, don't even want that one, so I'm just going to delete it. Uh, tags, I want to keep it, but I don't want to put it into a git, so I'll just add to the ignore file. There we go. Now, you can take a look at any file just by hitting the tab key. This shows you the differences of what's going to get committed, and hey, this is really useful when you notice there's a problem. Hitting return on the particular line allows you to edit that file directly. Let's just get rid of that, save it, let's go back here. There we go. That's the way I like it, so let's stage that. Now I've got a list of all the stage files that I want to commit. So you hit C, and C brings up a very interesting Magit approach in that they have these pop-ups that allow you to specify switches and options and various other things. So, for instance, if I want to always stage all of them, I can just hit dash A, and now I have the dash dash all option on. One of the other features about it is if you hit control T, it allows you to save those as, you know, your default options. Really quite useful for if you want to just always have particular options available or um, set before you even start. In this case, I don't need to do that, so I'll just turn it off. You see how it's toggled. Now, the actions is a secondary letter that you hit to kick off something. So I can hit A to amend it or S to squash, but in this case, I'm just doing a regular commit, so I'll just hit C. So 
What that means is you hit C twice in quick succession and you can just get right down here to the commit line. All right, uh, another nice feature about it, split into two screens where one side shows you all of the differences and the other one is, you know, that standard git command thingy. So let's just type in some commit message. Now, warnings appear if your verbiage falls outside the accepted norm. However, in my case, I could probably just enter something a little bit more appropriate or acceptable. Once you're done, you simply hit Control C, Control C twice. And there we go. We have our commit. We can push it. We hit capital P, and that gives you options on where to push it and options as well. Hitting another command, capital P, will push it to the server. Okay. Failure. What's wrong? Well, if you hit the dollar sign, that pulls up the status message, and you... Yes, of course. Someone beat me to it and committed before I had a chance to pull it. All right, fine. We'll do a fetch. That's Shift-F, and another Shift-F, and pull... Oh, dear. We've got a merge conflict. You can see that we have two sections, uh, or two commit messages here of two things that people have checked in. I can hit return on these guys to see what it was that they changed. Hmm. Okay. And of course, we want to get to the actual uh, conflict. So if you hit E, it starts off the uh, standard E diff message. Let me pull that down in here. Then hit N uh, to go the, the first commit difference and you can choose A or B on which side you want to keep, or you can just go right in and edit. I'm going to hit B to keep that one with what other people have changed. And let's save that. And here we go. All right, that looks good. Stage, and let's commit. There's our merge. Oh yeah, the merge line is too long. We'll commit anyway. And now we can push it. Done. You can set defaults for a lot of these things. Hitting L allows me to see that I've got a twig, a merge that has happened. Now twigs are intermediate branches that happen due to merges. And they're bad since they make your history complicated to follow. My team has been using Garrett for code reviews, and Garrett requires a sequential history. And this requires rebasing. And rebasing strikes fear in the hearts of mortal engineers. But fear not, let me show you another project in another repository, and show you some advanced maggot features that make things like rebasing much easier. Now this repo has a stash. Stashes are great until you forget what you put in there. So, it ha uh, Magit has this feature where you can just hit return and check out what you put in there. Ah, yeah, that one. That was a good quote. All right, so let's pull up the, uh, st the stash menu by hitting Z. And you can see where you can do things like save and, you know, drop. In this case, I'm going to hit P to pop it. And that takes that the files that were in that stash and just puts it in my end, sta uh, end stage section. Perfect. All right. Let's stage that and commit it. All right. Let's put a little quote in here and save it. Oh, this is interesting. I've got three quotes here, or three commits that are all from the same movie. Well, we should probably squash those. You see, in Gitland, if you haven't pushed these commits, then you can manipulate the history. Well, to do this, you hit R for rebasing. Now, rebase has a couple of options, and one of them is I can just rebase all the unpushed ones by hitting L. This brings up the standard rebase interactive mode, and you notice that the history here is reversed. Before, we've always seen the oldest things at the bottom. 
Now the oldest thing is at the top. Well, if I hit S to squash, I'm going to squash these newer commits into the older commit. Now when you do that, each commit message shows up in this file and, well, we just have to make one commit out of all of these. So let me just make a few changes here. Hmm. Whoops. <laughs> all right, there we go. Sorry about my alarm keyboard. Now I have all of those three commits smashed or squashed into one. Great, let's push it. <sighs> Not again. Yep, exactly. Someone's committed before me. All right, well, let's fetch these. Now in this case, notice there's no merge conflict. It just goes right into the merge feature. Now, of course, I could have fetched it with the rebasing, but I turned it off on purpose. All right, so we'll commit it. And let's take a look at this history. There's that twig. This, like I say, this happens when we've done a merge and we now have this intermediate branch. So I'm going to manipulate the history with rebasing. And in this case, what we do is we just move to the parent. So here's the parent before the twig happened, and I start the rebase. Now in this case, I'm going to hit I for interactive mode, and continue, and here we go. So the top one is the parent, and the oldest one, the new commits that came in, show up at the bottom. What all I want is my new commit. I just need to move this down in the history until it's the latest commit. Now, when I um, control C twice, and whoop, there we go. We now have a straight history as I put my last commit at the top of the list. Now, when I push, and here we have, we now have a very sequential history. Hmm. That might have been a little fast, but that's all right. How you should learn is just installing Maggot and playing around with it. It doesn't take much, and really all you need is this one function, Maggot Status. That will get you going to what you've been seeing, and then you can start hitting keys and playing around with it. Now, if you want to play around with a... Uh, a repository that has lots of commits and conflicts, well, you can grab my demonstration code. It's on GitHub. Grab the two shell scripts and run them, and they basically create what you've seen. Then you can play around and practice some of the advanced features like dealing with merge conflicts and all the things that happen while you're in a real repository. But in this case, if you screw up, you just delete it and start all over. The Maggot documentation is on the same par as the rest of Emacs's documentation. Complete, but maybe not very gentle. If you want a tutorial, Peterson has a chapter on Maggot. In later releases, Maggot has become more modular, and plugins are starting to be available to make Maggot even better. So watch that space. Well, this has been my short introduction to the wonderful world of Maggot. I hope you found it compelling enough to use it as it's one of those killer apps for Emacs that, well, I use daily. Hey, thanks for watching.